My name is Kimberly Kitching. I'm the chair of the committee. Joining us today are Senator Senator Abetz, the deputy chair, as well as Senators Van. Senator Rice is leaving us, I believe, um, and Senator Lambie is on the line as well. Um, for the Hansard record, could I each ask you each to please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Mr Power. Yeah, my name is Paul Power and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Refugee Council of Australia. Thank you. Mr, Mr. Jamal. And my name is Ahmed Shoja Jamal. I am a uh, Special Advisor at the Refugee Council of Australia. Thank you. Um, could I ask if you would like to make an opening statement before the committee proceeds to questions? Sure. Th thank you, Senator. Um, thank thank you. you for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, you all have seen the Refugee Council's um, supplementary submission in which we express concern about the inadequacy of the government's response through the Refugee and Humanitarian Program. Um, I think the, the most impressive aspect of the government's response to the crisis since the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan has certainly been the evacuation of 4,300 Afghan nationals. Uh, when the evacuation process started, no one expected Australia could evacuate such a significant number of people. I think everyone involved in this process should be truly proud of what has been achieved. Uh, the government response since then, however, has been quite disappointing. Uh, when we analyse Immigration Minister Alex Hawke's recent announcement of 10,000 humanitarian and 5,000 family migration visas for Afghan nationals over four years, we note that there won't be many more than 6,000 humanitarian visas remaining once, as expected, the vast majority of people who arrived on subclass 449 visas have applied for and received humanitarian visas. By comparison, in the four years to June 2019, well before the current crisis began, 6,125 Afghan nationals arrived on humanitarian visas over that four-year period. But 5,000 family visas for Afghans over four years is in fact lower than the number of family visas issued in the four years to June 2019, when 7,314 family visas were issued to Afghan nationals or the four years to June 2020 when 8,140 visas were granted. So once the 4,300 evacuees apply for and receive permanent visas, there will be fewer humanitarian and family visas available for Afghans over four years than were issued uh, over four years prior to the current crisis. What makes this worse is that the government has cut 28,382 visas out of the Refugee and Humanitarian Program since the 2019 election. The 2019 budget, which was delivered just before the election was called, included a humanitarian program of 18,750 visas a year over the four years of the forward estimates. The government's plans were to issue 75,000 humanitarian visas between July 2019 and June 2023. That figure has since been reduced to less than 47,000. The government cut 5,000 places per year over three years from the program from July 2020. And because of the COVID pandemic, failed to issue 13,382 of the remaining visas uh, between March 2020 and June 2021. By contrast, the migration program exceeded its target of 160,000 places last financial year, despite the pandemic. So compared to the loss of 28,382 humanitarian visas in less than two years, the request for an additional intake of 20,000 refugees from Afghanistan is very modest. As senators know, this call for an additional intake has received wide support from across the Australian community, from churches, veterans, Afghan community groups, non-government organisations, and many individual Australians. And this is in the light of the seriousness of the crisis and the extent of Australia's involvement in Afghanistan um, over the past 20 years. When the Abbott government in 2015 offered 12,000 additional humanitarian visas on top of the annual program for Syrian and Iraqi refugees, this resulted in 39,146 Syrian and Iraqis receiving humanitarian visas in the four years to June 2019. This was four times larger than the number of humanitarian visas now being offered over four years to Afghan nationals. Um, and as you uh, are aware, I'm 
uh, joined today by um, Ahmed Shuja Jamal, uh, who's now based in Brisbane and working with the Refugee Council as a special advisor, as you mentioned. Uh, Shuja, uh, until late August, worked for the government of Afghanistan as Director General for International Relations and, in and Regional Cooperation at the Afghan National Security Council. Uh, and he has a unique perspective on the situation within Afghanistan and the region and also on how a well-targeted response from Australia could make a strategically important contribution. So I'll, I'll pass on to Shuja. Thank you. Mr. Jamal, would you, Mr. Jamal, would you like to um, perhaps to um, flesh out that which Mr. Power has, um, you know, ha has just discussed? And um, we'd be very interested and um, you know, we thank you for the work that you did, not only in Afghanistan, but the work, but also the work that you are doing here in Australia. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, as you know, I am a former official of the Afghan Republic. In the last two years before the collapse of the Republic, I lived in Kabul and worked very closely with the Australian Embassy on issues of bilateral importance. Not only do I have relatives in Afghanistan, I also maintain contact with friends, former government colleagues, activists, journalists, and people from the aviation, humanitarian, and diplomatic communities in Afghanistan. Some of these people are in hiding, others are desperately trying to get out, yet others are agitating for a freer Afghanistan. My evidence today is informed by some of these sources. The situation in Afghanistan remains dire, unfortunately. The UN has called it the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. And although aid delivery is scaling up, Afghans complain of uneven distribution, including distribution to Taliban members and supporters. The Taliban continue to consolidate power and deepen their campaign of retribution against opponents and minority groups, including Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks, Turkmens, and Pashtuns in the opposition. The regime's consolidation of power betrays a lack of regard for international calls, including by Australia, to form an inclusive government. The Taliban also introduced more repressive social measures about women's public appearance, men's beards, and restrictions on teenage girls' education. The UN and US Treasury Department's humanitarian carve-outs to their sanctions regimes, while welcome, are falling short of their intended effect because international banks are skittish to engage with Afghan banks for fear of running afoul of sanctions. Australia should work with partner nations to reassure these financial institutions to maximize the impact of the humanitarian exceptions. The enforced disappearance of Tamanna Parioni and her sisters from their home in January after they protested against the Taliban is a reminder of how the Taliban deal with dissent. Former members of Afghan security forces and others associated with the government have also been targeted, often taken from their homes, killed and their bodies dumped. Alia Azizi, a former police official, went missing after she reported for duty last October. She is a Hazara and is feared abducted by the Taliban. Although neighboring countries remain unreceptive to Afghans, diplomatic work with countries like Pakistan can help at-risk Afghans awaiting resettlement to gain access to and remain there in safety. This is a ray of hope for at-risk individuals who potentially qualify for Australian visas, and I urge Australia to consider this. It can literally save lives. Respected Senators, before the world's eyes, Afghanistan is sinking into an authoritarian regime with summary executions, enforced disappearances, gender apartheid, and a stifled media. Australia and the international community could do something about it. They hold the cards. They have what the Taliban crave, which is international legitimacy. But before countries with different priorities step in and give the Taliban just that, it is important for Australia and its partner nations to coordinate actions quickly and seek a more permanent, nationally representative and rights-respecting political arrangement in Afghanistan. This remains possible. The Taliban themselves call their de facto regime an interim government. Afghan politicians, activists inside the country and diaspora are organizing in this direction. It is time for the world to amplify their voices. More concretely, senators, diplomatic representations of the Afghan Republic accredited to various host nations remain active despite the many difficulties. They provide critical consular services, and in the case of Australia, to Afghan Australians, permanent residents and their families. Yet, their ability to continue to provide these services is not guaranteed, partly because of evolving host country dispositions. I urge Australia to continue to enable the mission in Canberra to provide these services. 
Normalizing the Taliban will send the wrong message to Afghans whose aspirations are not represented by the authoritarian regime. Equally importantly, it normalizes an instant of state formation and behavior that runs counter to values shared by Australians and Afghans. How Australia and the international community choose to deal with the Taliban at this moment will reverberate in history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jamal. I'm just going to ask Senator Rice because she's going to another committee hearing if she has any questions she'd like to ask before she has to go uh, imminently to that to another committee. Thanks, Chair. And look, thank you, Mr. Power and Mr. Jamal, for your evidence today. It's really powerful, certainly. And Mr. Power, thank you very much for reiterating the need for Australia to be doing more and how we're just not doing playing our fair uh, a role, a global role, given this. Um, the desperate situation in Afghanistan. So thank you for that. Mr Jamal, I just wanted to ask, given your experience on the ground, as to what you say that countries like Australia hold the cards. I mean, what, in terms of pressure on the Taliban, what more do you think Australia could be doing to be getting, you know, Get, getting the, the worst excesses of the Taliban to be to be reduced. In particular, do you think there's more we could be doing in terms of pressuring Pakistan as well? Um, you say you talked about the role that Pakistan's playing, but we know that at the moment Pakistan is not a, allowing many refugees to flow through, that they've got to have a passport, they've got to have a Pakistan visa. And thirdly, um, I'm glad you mentioned the, the awful situation of the diplomats of the Afghan Republic, various embassies around the world. Do you think Australia could be doing more in terms of providing um, um, refugee status and, and, and visas for those people? And I know of, of, I've heard stories of some in some countries that have basically not been able to get any, um, any country to accept them. So they are just you know, stuck at the moment still in their posts, but under huge pressure from the Taliban in their posts. Thank you, Senator, for all of these very important questions. And these are some of the questions that we've worked with um, the Afghan uh, diplomatic corps, the Australian government, but also people in Afghanistan at the moment. We've heard various reasons from the Australian government on working with Pakistan. Um, I believe it is um, it is it, Pakistan is in a uh, the Pakistani policy is that they have kept their borders open to Afghans wanting to come into Pakistan, but they have not issued visas to a single Afghan over a long period of time, several months, in fact, over the past year or so, um, which has given rise to desperation, but also given rise to people paying very large amounts to brokers who can then uh, uh, who feign to provide them visas from the embassy. And that has created a situation of abuse that I think is certainly avoidable. Uh, and it is avoidable also because certain countries, and it is my understanding that Ecuador and Brazil are among them, offer visas to Afghans if they can demonstrate that they have an active application for the U.S., uh, for settlement in the U.S., uh, uh, including, as an example, uh, applications for humanitarian parole. All they have to demonstrate is a reference number confirming their application is active. Um, and so I think Australia can actually enter into a conversation with Pakistan to enable, at least to enable Afghans who have active resettlement cases with Australia uh, to be there in safety and, and to make use of um, uh, the, the better conditions of life in that country. Um, I also think in res with respect to your first question about what Australia can do, I think uh, it is important that Australia joins hands with other like-minded countries because uh, with respect to the Taliban, I think a, a coordinated voice, a coordinated action is a lot more effective, not just with the Taliban, but also because it can help their biggest regional supporter, Pakistan, to play a more constructive role in that direction. Um, the Taliban at the moment are actually craving international legitimacy. They are dying for a single country to recognize them politically and diplomatically. And although countries like Pakistan have de facto relationships without recognizing an accredited ambassador, they are working with the Taliban at various levels. Um, it is time, I think, for Australia to use that leverage of being able to offer recognition and support to the Taliban 
uh, with other like-minded nations, nations who care for the same values that Australia does, um, to, to urge not just Pakistan, but also the Taliban. Uh, there, there, there's an incentive that they can use at this moment, and there's nothing more important to the Taliban than that. But also, uh, the Taliban are craving delisting from the UN sanctions, but also delisting with from under US sanctions. And those are the kind of normalizing uh, uh, efforts that the international community could actively use to seek to change Taliban's behavior irrespective of influence through Pakistan. Um, and I think it is important that deep, deep thought is given on this uh, and work is done quickly rather than slowly because other nations are stepping in and giving the Taliban what they want without uh, having the same kinds of values-based approach that uh, that we think Australia should have at the moment, given the Taliban's excesses. With respect to the diplomatic missions, there are um, indications that certain countries in the world are actually changing their disposition toward Afghan diplomatic missions, including uh, in, through actions such as freezing their bank accounts, such as withholding, uh, um, such as uh, giving them ultimatums to close down their embassies and hand the key over to uh, the host nation. We think that this is a move in exactly the wrong direction at a time with not only many Afghans who want consular services, Afghan Australians and their relatives, but also uh, as a message to the world that these diplomats who are already accredited and are working under dire circumstances um, are being thwarted in a way that is counterproductive, not just to the citizens of these countries who are of Afghan origin, but also sends the wrong message on normalizing the Taliban. Um, and, and with respect to your question about what can be done for individual diplomats, I think beyond just enabling them to continue to do their work, including offering essential services, uh, it is essential um, that when they come to the Australian government seeking protection and seeking asylum, uh, that their legitimate, I think very legitimate uh, cases are heard uh, fairly and they're given uh, due process rights um, and, in my opinion, heard sympathetically. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Rice. I'll go to Senator Abetz now. You might... Eric, I think you're on mute. I'm on mute. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, thank you for your submission. Um, very helpful. You stressed, Mr Jamal, the importance of a coordinated effort, and uh, I see that as being very important, because otherwise the Taliban, which is so anxious to get some international recognition, will seek to pick us off one by one, rather than having a very strong united voice. And so can I ask, what's your view in relation to Australia delivering its aid, etc., through the United Nations, given the horrific uh, situation that you described in your opening statement as to how the Taliban behaves, um, because it seems to me there's the potential, at least, for well-meaning but small NGOs uh, being taken in by the Taliban to, de to deliver things that they want to need, rather than having this strong, uh, united voice uh, from the world community. I think that's um, a, a very important question. Uh, we have called uh, uh, through the Refugee Council of Australia for Australia to in increase its humanitarian uh, commitment to Afghanistan as part of the UN's uh, humanitarian response plan. Uh, we think that the UN at this current juncture uh, has a confluence of multiple things going forward. Number one, it is willing to step up. Number two, it is capable of scaling its operations across the country. Number three, it has a depth of understanding across the country that fewer other NGOs have. And they also have a dialogue with the Taliban that I think offers them a relative competitive advantage uh, in delivering those services. So I fully support that. Um, I think that is in line with uh, what we believe to be best practices at the moment. Uh, but what your question highlights, uh, and, and I, it's also important for me to underscore that other NGOs who are 
partners with the UN and they have joined in the UN's appeal for the for the humanitarian response plan also offer important critical services. Uh, a lot of these NGOs also reach places that the UN cannot. And so their role is complementary often rather than uh, rather than otherwise. Uh, but your question, I think, uh, uh, also has another aspect, uh, Senator, that Australia um, should do all it can to stop the Afghan economy from a complete collapse, uh, as currently it is in freefall. And I think there are multiple things that could be done, uh, including uh, by enabling the Afghan private banking sector to operate in ways um, that could avoid the sanction. There are technical fixes. Uh, Minds Smarter Than Mine have provided several policy recommendations as to how to prop up the Afghan economy and uh, put it back on its legs without uh, normalizing the Taliban or giving them access to potential funds. Thank you. Look, okay, thank you and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Rivets. Um, look. Thank you very much for your evidence here today. We very much appreciate your time and your submission, uh, which um, is extensive, so thank you. Um, I don't believe you've taken any questions on notice, but if you have, um, the Secretariat will be in touch with you and they would be due back on the 14th of February. But uh, I thank you once again, and the committee will now adjourn until 1.45.